Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association's premier webinar entitled DSM-5 Update for Mental Health Counselors. Uh, this historic event is a kickoff for our Emerging Issues in Mental Health Counseling webinar series that will run through 2015. Um, the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association is dedicated to providing members with the latest news and information in our field, and we're pleased to offer this complimentary webinar series as one of the many be benefits of membership. My name is Michael Holler. I serve on the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association board, and I will be your moderator today. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to give you some information on the format for today's webinar. Because the presenter will be providing a thorough and extensive overview of today's topic, we'll be moving at a pretty fast pace. To maximize our time, we will not be accepting any questions until the Q&A portion at the end of today's broadcast. Sorry about that. If you have a question, please type your question in the chat box on your screen. I will be compiling these questions throughout the broadcast, and I will read them to the presenter during the Q&A session. If we don't get to your question, no worries. The presenter has agreed to answer any unanswered questions on today's material through email after the presentation. He will also show you how to download a complimentary PDF file of today's webinar before he concludes this presentation. CEUs or contact hours, which we tend to use interchangeably, but just a little side note, contact. So CEU is 10 contact hours, but we're going to use the generic term CEUs. CEUs are being offered for today's webinar at no cost to Florida Mental Health Counselors Association members. We ask all attendees to complete a brief survey at the conclusion of the broadcast. If you would like CEUs, you will need to provide some additional information during that survey that we will use to, to report your attendance to CE Broker. The survey should automatically appear on your screen at the end of the broadcast. If you are unable to complete the uh, survey at the conclusion of the broadcast, that's no worries there either, uh, you will also receive an email providing instructions on how to complete the survey later. However, we do ask that you complete this survey within 72 hours in order to, retreat, to receive those CEUs. Please do not complete the survey more than once. We would like to remind you that this webinar is intended to be a free benefit for our Florida Mental Health Counselors Association members. But in the future, we will need to charge uh, for CEUs in order to cover our costs. It has been decided that this cost will be $10 for Florida Mental Health Counselors Association members and $30 for non-members. To answer a question that has been presented several times regarding this and future presentations for those who are unable to attend in person, it is our intention to record these presentations and make them available for later participation. However, we are not sure whether this one will be available until we see if the recording is successful. This is sort of the pilot run. We may have to work out some bugs in that process first, so please bear with us. We do intend to make these available. Um, we would also like to strongly encourage any of you who are not Florida Mental Health Counselors Association members to join the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association. We need, as a profession, to band together to further the quality of our profession. There are many benefits to the belonging. We have lobbyists who are representing us in Florida. We provide free trainings, such as today, with CEUs for a nominal cost. And as you can see, it's $10 for members, $30 for non-members. So that's a, a pretty deep discount. Try to find that price anywhere else for CEUs. And the quality is, I'm sure you're going to see, excellent. We provide an annual conference of excellent quality for ongoing training, among other benefits. Please do consider joining us. I'll now introduce today's pre presenter. Aaron Norton is a licensed mental health counselor, a certified addictions pro professional, certified rehabilitation counselor, and certified forensic mental health evaluator at Integrity Counseling, a group private practice in Pinellas County, Florida, where he specializes in clinical evaluation, cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety and depressive disorders, motivational interviewing for addictive disorders, and clinical supervision for registered mental health counselor interns. He's an adjunct instructor for the Department of Rehabilitation and Mental Health Counseling at the University of South Florida's College of Behavioral and Community Sciences. He serves as president of the Sun Coast Mental Health Counselors Association, the Tampa Bay Area chapter of the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association, and he is the chair of the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association Education, Training Standards, and Continuation, Continuing Education Committee. Please, at this time, welcome Aaron Norton. I'm sure you'll be very pleased with this presentation. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And it is a pleasure to be here with you all today. This is exciting. Our first FOMCO webinar. 
and we're going to have a series of webinars coming up in um, 2015 for you all. A great benefit for FOMCA members. All right, so I'm going to move pretty quickly here, so let's get on with it. DSM-5 update, out with the old and in with the new. Um, I am pretty passionate about this topic. Um, it's, it's sort of made it a mission of mine to, to kind of help update counselors and um, the newest uh, diagnostic procedures and concepts and keep us up to speed with our other allies in, in the mental health treatment industry. So what we're going to be covering today is we're going to start off with sort of an overview of the changes of the DSM-5 and we're going to focus on the paradigm shift with the fifth edition because what I think is what's pretty clear to me anyway is that once you get an understanding of the paradigm shift, once you know what it is that they were intending with the DSM-5, all these little changes with the disorders themselves and the symptoms and verbiage changes, they all start to come together. They start to make sense if you can start with what is the paradigm shift. So we're going to focus on that first. We're going to have some, uh, some little hints at DSM-5 controversies that we'll talk about. Uh, we won't go into great length for time purposes. We're going to get into section two of the DSM-5 and look at the way that we organize disorders into chapters and the changes with the disorders themselves. Um, what disorders are new? Which ones are um, no longer exist? And what are the changes within um, the disorders that have been carried over from the fourth edition? And then we're going to go into section three of the DSM-5. We're going to look at what's new there. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on some resources. I want to make sure that all of you walk away today with some resources um, that you can use to get some additional information. Because this is just a cursory review, two hours. And two hours time, we can only cover so much with such a broad topic. And we're going to get into some questions and answers at the end. I'm hoping to have a good amount of time for that. But um, as, as Michael discussed earlier, um, I've offered to answer any questions by email that we can't answer in today's session for time purposes so that we can still make sure you're getting uh, the maximum benefit of this training. So if we start off with why we even have a DSM, we have it for trained clinicians to use for diagnosis, for assessment, for concept case conceptualization and treatment planning. But the reality is that the DSM is used for so many other purposes. Um, the DSM is used for determining eligibility for social programs, government programs, um, Social Security Administration, disability cases. Um, it's used for um, forensic purposes. Um, the DSM uh, today is being used for a lot of purpose that ex purposes that extend well beyond its intended purpose. So any time that we make changes to the DSM, we're going to see a lot of controversy because the implications are going to be wide and diverse, um, but it's, it wasn't created for those purposes. So now we as professional counselors, part of our professional identity is that when you really trace, trace our profession back to its roots, we were, really weren't focused on pathology. And we were focused on helping people to make career and lifestyle choices. Um, we are very holistic. That's our nature as counselors. We pay a lot of attention to developmental processes and influences. Some of us don't particularly like labels, and we don't particularly like operating from a pathological model. But the DSM-5 is about pathology. It really wasn't until um, the 1963 Com Community Mental Health Centers Act that um, counselors really started to get into the arena of treating pathology, and that was expanded greatly in the 80s and 90s with the rise of managed care and with counselors being placed on um, insurance panels. Um, but even though our roots are, are less um, focused on pathology, we have to look at the whole person and we need to be able to recognize pathology when it's in the room with us. And we're expected to know that. It's part of, part of the scope of practice of professional counselors is for us to be able to diagnose and treat mental disorders. KCREP requires that we be knowledgeable of the DSM. And um, our insurance contracts certainly require it. You can't um, work with insurance without working with pathology. So we got to know this stuff, and we have to keep updated and stay relevant in our field. Now, if we look at the history of the DSM, if you look very closely at the tiny, tiny little yellow sliver at the very top of this stack, that small little pamphlet-looking material, even above the DSM-2 there, is the first edition of the DSM. Very thin work, um, mostly brief, sort of psychodynamic kinds of descriptions of disorders. 
um, very subjective diagnostic process, and pretty much the same with the DSM-2. It really wasn't until the DSM-3, you can see right there at the DSM-3, we get this um, significantly larger volume. And with each volume from the DSM-3 on, the work has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger until we get to the DSM-5. Surprisingly, the DSM-5 is actually a little bit smaller than the previous, um, than several of the previous editions. That's one thing they wanted to attend was actually cut back a little bit, and I'll explain a little bit more how they accomplished that. But the big trend, the big paradigm shift with the DSM-3 was that we moved towards a medicalized model of conceptualizing, diagnosing, and treating disorders where we had very specific diagnostic criteria. And the idea was to make the diagnostic process more valid and more reliable, um, and, uh, and to have more accuracy, more objectivity in the diagnostic process. And really, truthfully speaking, um, the reliability certainly increased with the DSM-3 and beyond. So we kind of accomplished that. Now, one other thing that you'll see that's different in this picture is that the DSM-5 is the first edition that uses an Arabic numeral instead of a Roman numeral. So you actually see the digit, the number 5, instead of um, the V that symbolizes the Roman numeral 5. And that's to kind of be more contemporary, more modern, but also um, our understanding is that we're going to see things like hopefully more frequent updates in between editions. Um, so you might see DSM 5.1, DSM 5.2, and so forth. Kind of gives a little bit more of a trendy um, feel, I guess, to it. So let's move on to the paradigm shift with the DSM-5. What is it exactly that um, they wanted to accomplish with the fifth edition that makes it a little bit different than the previous edition? Well, the first thing is that we are increasingly moving towards more of a multidimensional spectrum-based model of understanding uh, mental disorders. And so with these spectrums, what we're going to see is that um, in the DSM-4, there are several occasions where you have maybe two, three, or four different disorders that essentially are the same thing with one exception, and that one exception usually has to do with severity. So in the DSM-5, several attempts were made to take very similar disorders and lump them together into one disorder, but then create a spectrum of some kind, spectrums that range from mild to severe, or that range based on level of support or intervention needed, and so forth. So we'll see kind of more simplistic diagnostic categories, but many more options within a category um, so that clinicians can, in, in, a, in a single title, a single diagnostic label, can communicate a wide range of information Obviously, you're going to have two people, for example, with, um, with major depressive disorder, and they're going to have significant differences in terms of symptom manifestation and in terms of severity. And these new specifiers that are being added will give us more options um, to really be more descriptive of an individual client with that label. The second thing that they really wanted to do is they really wanted to work against that age-old, ancient concept of mind-body dualism. Mind-body dualism basically denotes that our minds and our bodies are separate and distinctively different realms. But the American Psychiatric Association, the gatekeepers of the DSM, um, they have come through with this breakthrough recognition. And that breakthrough recognition is that our brains are, in fact, part of our bodies. And that because, you know, who knows what kind of newfangled technology was used for that discovery, but our brains are part of our bodies, and therefore mental disorders are real physical disorders. They're real conditions. It's real medicine. And so we should stop um, working so hard to separate the psychological realm from the physical realm when a lot of its brain chemistry, a lot of its genetics, a lot of its um, overlap um, between those two realms. So the DSM-5... Um, was intended to do a better job of recognizing that tremendous overlap. So we are going to see also that um, the DSM-5 is not a big fan of the NOS category, that old not otherwise specified diagnosis. I don't know about you, but I mean, so many times I would see very lengthy, detailed, thorough psychological evaluations, um, or in some cases, very non-thorough evaluations, psychiatric evaluations and so forth that would come back with a slew of NOS diagnoses. Well, not only specified diagnoses um, were being overused as kind of the position of um, the folks with DSM-5. And 
sometimes we would just slap an NOS on things because we didn't have the time or couldn't take the time or didn't want to take the time to do a better diagnostic, um, to engage in a more thorough diagnostic process. So um, they wanted to cut back on all this NOS stuff. So they actually got rid of NOS. They give some other options instead. But they want clinicians to be able to show you in the title of the diagnosis why it is that a person does not neatly fit into a particular diagnostic category. So I'm going to show you several examples of that. I also wanted to in increase our understanding of cultural and developmental lifespan influences in the diagnostic process and be more developmentally sensitive and culturally sensitive. They really wanted to further delineate between abnormal and pathological behavior. Obviously, just because somebody's behavior, their symptom manifestations or whatever, clump on one extreme of that bell-shaped curve or another does not mean they're disordered. Abnormal is not disordered. And so we will actually see some depathologizing in the DSM-5 despite some of the controversy that it um, over pathologizes. We're going to see cleaning up of some language. This is some real verbiage from a previous edition of the DSM going way back where we, they actually used phrases that were diagnostic, um, actually labels of um, disorders. Idiot, imbecile, moron. Who would have known the terms that were used by the Three Stooges were actually you know, clinical terminology of their time. Um, so, it, of course, keeping up with um, with languages, uh, contemporary languages, very much hitting a moving target. And so we're going to see that several terms that were um, put into the DSM-4, we would no longer consider to be appropriate terminology, or they would be insensitive terminology, um, or have a pejorative sort of um, uh, interpretation. So we got rid of some of those labels and updated them a little bit. So. The term general medical condition in the DSM-4, you might see something like a mood disorder due to a general medical condition. You won't see that anymore. You will now see a new phrase, another medical condition. Now that is obviously seems like a very minor verbiage change. It's only one word changing. But the conceptually, it, it represents something big, which comes back to um, elimination of that mind-body dualism uh, concept. Med mental disorders are medical conditions. So you can have disorders that aren't considered mental disorders. They would be other medical conditions, but the mental disorders themselves are also medical conditions. The multi-axial classification system, axis 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 that we used in the DSM-4, they're gone. They no longer exist. They've been discontinued um, for several reasons. One of them is that they found that people, unfortunately, even though this was never the intention, People would think of whatever they see in Axis 1 as being the important real thing to treat or focus on, and the other things not so much. That was never the intention, um, and we'll get into some specifics about that in a moment. The global assessment of functioning, the GAF score, is also gone. The GAF score was not being used accurately. I mean, the way I learned how to use the GAF score is when I was a new counselor, my very first counseling position in a residential treatment center, I didn't know what that GAF score even meant. So I got my first psychosocial update. I get to the GAF score. I ask my clinical supervisor, what's that GAF thing, and how do I figure that out? And the supervisor says, okay, what you do is you go to the chart, you look at the date they were admitted to the program, you look at the GAF score someone put in there, and you raise it from that number. But don't raise it this high. Once they hit this number, then people will say they're too, they're too high functioning to be in this level of care anymore, so make sure you keep it in this range. That's obviously not the accurate way to use the GAF score um, system. What they found is that those are the kinds of ways that we were using the GAF score, plus they found that there was very little reliability, inter-rater reliability with GAF scores. People come up with dramatically different numbers. They also thought it was way overly simplistic and just um, inaccurate to try and quantify a person's entire level of functioning with one number. But as you all know, you can have two people with the same GAF score, but very different presentations, very different areas of strength and weakness, and levels of functioning are, very, are variable from one area to another. So what did they replace it with? Well, technically, they replaced it with nothing. They don't require that you do anything to replace a GAF score, but they do recommend something. They recommend that you consider using the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Scale, also known as the HUDAS. The HUDAS is pretty cool because it gives you several different areas of functioning that you can quantify. 
using a somewhat more objective process, a radar system. So you will see things like there's one area for um, independent living skills or life skills um, or activities of daily living, actually. And there's another category for getting along with other people and so forth. So you'll be able to be much more descriptive of the client's functioning with that tool. And that tool is available for free. I'll show you how to get it later. They even updated their definition of a mental disorder, and if you read this later on, we won't go through it now, I'm not here just to read things on a slide for you, but if you look at it later on, you'll see that the, that paradigm shift that I told you about, it's very much embodied in this revised definition of a mental disorder. You'll see the cultural and developmental stuff, you'll see the paradigm shift and so forth. And you'll see even the um, depathologizing in that new definition. They also have a cautionary statement for forensic use in Section 1 of the DSM-5. I'm not going to go over it with you. It's on here later for you to look at. Give you just the, the bottom line is that the DSM-5, the APA recognizes the DSM-5 was never intended to be used for forensic purposes. Nonetheless, it is used for forensic purposes. And so because it is used for forensic purposes, um, and, and actually they, they give some sort of clarification on how it could be used effectively, how it can actually be used and misused. So they give you some insight into that with the um, forensic cautionary statement. All right, let's look and see what we got here. So let's talk for just a brief moment about the relationship between the DSM and the ICD. The ICD, of course, is the International Classification of Diseases. That's a volume put out by the World Health Organization. This is a universal international coding system for diagnoses. Now, all HIPAA-regulated U.S. healthcare providers are required to use ICD-9 um, codes currently. Now, when you opened up your old DSM-4, all those numbers you saw next to each diagnosis, those were not DSM numbers. I know it might sound weird because they're in the DSM, but they're not DSM numbers. Those are ICD numbers, ICD-9 numbers specifically. Um, they come from the World Health Organization, not from the APA. The APA simply shows you which DSM diagnoses match with which ICD codes. Well, effective October 1st, 2015, all U.S. HIPAA-regulated healthcare providers will be required to shift from ICD-9 to ICD-10, right about the time that the rest of the world will be shifting to the ICD-11. Um, they're, al they're almost there at ICD-11 now. So ICD-10 codes are very different from ICD-9 codes. They're alphanumeric. So I give you an example of generalized anxiety disorder. The ICD-9 code was 300.02. The ICD-10 code is F41.1. Currently, you use 300.02 when you want to submit for um, coverage for insurance purposes or um, Medicaid or whatever else. But you will be using F41.1 effective October 1, 2015. Now, the DSM-5 was released prior to the ICD-10 coming into effect, but what they have done for your convenience is each diagnosis will have next to it both the ICD-9 code and the ICD-10 code. The ICD-10 code is in parentheses. So they've got you covered. So now that we got rid of that multi-axial diagnostic system, what might a DSM-5 diagnosis actually look like? Well, basically, the clinician is going to list the diagnoses in order of clinical relevance or clinical focus. What is it that I'm focused on with this client? Um, and you can see in this sample diagnosis, which I took from an issue of Counseling Today magazine, which has a wonderful series on, on using DSM-5, um, the clinician chose to place the V code on top. And then the second code is a personality disorder, because that was the second biggest area of uh, clinical focus or relevance, and um, so on. So. Um, the, this is an example of what a DSM-5 diagnosis might look like. Basically, you just don't list axes. You just list them in order of relevance. Now, there's the question, by the way, of, well, I see overweight or obesity here, but licensed mental health counselors, you know, we're not um, credentialed to diagnose things like obesity, are we? What if somebody had asthma? Would we write that diagnosis on there? What if they had a diabetes? Um, would we write diabetes type 2 in our diagnosis? Well, um, the consensus seems to be, and what I would strongly recommend, is when we're talking about non-mental disorders, you know, other medical conditions that are outside of your scope of practice, um, if you have 
the documentation from an appropriately credentialed medical professional, an MD or a DO or an ARMP or whatever else, um, that documents that medical diagnosis and it's relevant to the work you're doing with the client, then write it. But if you don't have documentation that it's a legitimate diagnosis from an appropriate professional, then what I would write is something like diabetes, um, and then I would put something like in parentheses um, by client self-report, so you're kind of covered. But the idea is that medical disorders, uh, or let me correct myself, other medical um, conditions that are not mental disorders um, that are still relevant to the work you're doing, they should be showing up in your diagnosis. Okay, so um, we talked about how they want to depathologize. Some examples we'll see with paraphilias and gender um, identity disorder now being gender dysphoria. We'll see some examples there. Um, they also added some new diagnoses for disorders that clearly um, seem to be valid disorders that um, imply clinically significant impairment or distress, but they're just, they just fall short of a diagnostic threshold. And part of why they created these new diagnoses is to reduce the use of NOS. So, for example, there would be people who um, did not meet the, the full criteria for amnestic disorder, but nonetheless they have neurocognitive deficits that generate significant impairment or distress that warrant clinical attention, so they created a new mild neurocognitive disorder. Um, people who would binge eat without compensatory behaviors would not be eligible for bulimia, yet they clearly have a problem that oftentimes is causing significant distress, and they could benefit from psychotherapy or other approaches, so they have a new binge eating disorder. We'll talk more about that later. They wanted to cut back on the number of diagnoses per client. Part of that is, again, merging some diagnoses together and then creating spectrums of classification within a particular disorder, so you don't have to add a bunch of new extra diagnoses but that you're more descriptive in your one or two diagnoses than you used to be. And so they got rid of not otherwise specified. What we now have is two options. Option number one is you can say other specified. So let me give you an example. Depressive disorder, comma, other specified. And then what you must do is you must specifically say in your diagnosis, in your label itself, why the person doesn't neatly fit into something like major depressive disorder or dysthymic disorder or whatever else. So you may see something like um, other specified depressive disorder, comma, does not, um, dys, uh, dysthymia that does not meet full duration criteria. So you can see in the label, when you're looking at the diagnostic label itself, exactly why the person doesn't. Maybe this person's had the symptoms of dysthymic disorder for one year and 11 months and 10 days, but they haven't had it for two years. And the diagnostic criteria for dysthymic disorder requires a minimum of two years, but nonetheless, they've got clinically significant impairment of stress. You don't think that dysthymia is going to be going anywhere magically in the next couple of weeks, and they're in your office now and they need help. So instead of an NOS, you might say other specified depressive disorder, um, dysthymia that does not meet full duration criteria. So very descriptive options. Now, there are other options to go with an unspecified. You could say depressive, you could say unspecified depressive disorder, and then you don't have to say why it is that the person's not fitting into a, a depressive disorder diagnosis. Well, obviously, the pessimists among us are saying that's just going to become the new NOS. Everything's going to be unspecified all of a sudden. One hand giveth and the other taketh away. So we'll see how that goes. But they really are discouraging the use of unspecified. That's like a last resort. Your due diligence as a clinician should be do a differential diagnosis, a thorough process. And if, they, if you determine you know what's going on, but they don't seem to meet the full criteria, then go with the other specified and say why. And that's what they would like you to do. Now, when we talk about discrepancies, a lot of people are through a big deal about how Thomas Insel, the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health, published this sharp criticism of the DSM-5, where he basically says, look, the DSM-5 is reliable, yes. Valid, no. Not valid because we're still using a classification system that classifies disorders based on symptoms rather than on the underlying abnormalities within the organism that produces those symptoms. So to give you a comparison, if you came into your primary care physician with a chronic cough, your primary care physician isn't going to diagnose chronic cough syndrome. 
your your primary care physician hopefully will either figure out what is that cough connected to, what underlying abnormality is it a symptom of, or will it pass you off to a specialist who will help find that out, like maybe an ENT or something. Um, so he's got a point here, but at the same time, um, just a few days later, he publishes a new statement that you'll see under the second bullet point here, where he basically says, yeah, but you know what? It is the best we have at our hands right now. It's the best tool that we have, and it is the gold standard. A lot of people missed that second half, and they only caught on to the first part. So it's not true that the National Institutes of Mental Health is saying don't use the DSM. That's not true at all. Um, they are merely offering a criticism of what they consider to be the best currently available system. That's a more accurate way to describe um, what they did. So what's actually in your DSM? You get an introduction to the DSM-5, and you get to um, read about how to use it appropriately and what are, what are appropriate and inappropriate uses of the DSM, who should or should not be using it. Those sorts of things are covered. And then the cautionary statement for forensic use that we talked about. Section 2 is the bulk of the DSM-5, where you will see the diagnostic criteria and the codes. And then we get into Section 3, where we get these really cool assessment measures that I'll be showing you how to access for free. Um, cultural formulation and information, and a new alternative model for diagnosing um, personality disorders. Now, there's a history behind this bullet point. We expected that when the DSM-5 was published, we would see an entirely new classification system for personality disorders. I believe, if I remember correctly, it's called the hybrid multidimensional model. If it's not, then it's close verbiage to that. But it's basically a way of recognizing that um, a few things. Number one, very few people meet the diagnostic criteria for one and only one personality disorder. Many times when you really assess thoroughly, they meet the criteria for more than one personality disorder. Number two, many people don't meet the full criteria for any personality disorder, but they have smatterings of several of those personality disorders that add up to something really big and important. So um, a lot of people get personality disorder NOS within the DSM-4, for example, for those reasons. Well, this new model is sort of a smorgasbord. You know, it's basically somebody has a personality disorder, and these are the smatterings of maladaptive personality traits that come along for the ride that are very individualized and customized and tailored to that client. Very interesting. This is consistent with what the rest of the world is doing. This isn't a new thing the APA just came up with. But this is what the World Health Organization is doing. This is where the ICD-11 is supposedly headed and so forth. Um, it's just a less dichotomous model. Um, and I kind of like that. As a cognitive therapist, I'm not a big fan of extremely um, dichotomous, all or non black and white thinking. So, um, so I kind of like the new model. But clinicians' roses stink about it. I mean, we just sometimes do not like change. And people were so critical, and they didn't want to lose their old personality disorders. So, what they did at the last minute was they put it in Section 3 to be considered for adoption in a future edition. I think the rationale is we want to ease clinicians into it slowly. First start off by getting it in Section 3, let people get familiar with it, talk about it, debate it, all that stuff, and then I feel very confident that probably with the DSM-6 we will be seeing that that model or something very similar to it has been instituted. You will also see conditions for further study. In, the, in Section 3, which is all the disorders that are be cons being considered for adoption in a future um, edition. And then finally, you'll see your appendix. That's what we get in the DSM-5. Now, if you move into Section 2 of the DSM-5, you get these 22 chapters. These are categories of disorders, ways that we will take different disorders uh, that are similar in some way and group them together. There are several changes to pay attention to with this. One change is that um, the, well, the biggest thing that I'll say with this slide is that all of the different chapters have been arranged based on developmental lifespan influence. So the neurodevelopmental disorders, um, usually their etiology or their diagnosis is earlier in life, whereas personality disorders that show up in Chapter 18 tend to be diagnosed in adulthood. So the, the order actually follows the developmental lifespan to a great degree. And then the chapters themselves have disorders that are very similar, and they try to implement a lot of neuroscience with this too. They try to do more of exactly what the NIMH is criticizing them for, which is trying to figure out which disorders seem to be biologically more related to each other in terms of etiology, and then lumping those disorders together.
So a lot of the criticisms are actually, strangely enough, things that the DSM-5 attempted to make progress with. Now, if we get to look at these chapters in greater detail, we used to have in the DSM-4, the first chapter in Section 2 was disorders first diagnosed in infancy, ch infancy childhood, or adolescence. Basically, we thought of it as the uh, um, more or less the juvenile chapter. Well, they deleted that chapter. Now, a couple things. First of all, don't worry. Those disorders didn't disappear. They just deleted the chapter. Um, why did they do it? And some people say, well, this doesn't make sense. Didn't they want to enhance our developmental sensitivity? Well, they did, and that's actually part of why they did it. They did it in part because, unfortunately, what began to happen is clinicians who work with a particular age group began to neglect disorders that weren't listed in the chapter that they tend to deal with. So, for example, if I worked with adults only, then I would statistically be more likely to overlook disorders that would have been contained in the childhood disorders chapter. I might be less sensitive to things like, could the person have ADHD, or could they have autism? Well, meanwhile, um, people who work with adults, uh, or people who work with um, adolescents and children only, would tend to ignore things like personality disorders. Now, I know we were trained, don't diagnose personality disorders until they're in adulthood, but that's not actually true. When it's clear cut, you can diagnose a personality disorder in adolescents, like borderline personality disorder, for example. So uh, we got rid of that chapter so that clinicians would be more efficient and accurate and and be more thorough in their diagnostic process. The old chapter, Delirium, Dementia, Amnestic, and Other Cognitive Disorders, has been renamed a much simpler and succinct Neurocognitive Disorders title, which I like. That rolls off the tongue much faster. Mental Disorders Due to a GMC and NEC. That chapter has been deleted because, again, that's symbolic of eliminating the concept of mind-body dualism. Those disorders belonged with, um, I mean, for example, a depressive disorder that would be due to another medical condition should go in the depressive disorders chapter. It shouldn't go in a separate chapter just because it's connected to some other medical condition is the rationale because, again, the mind and the body are very much overlapping. The old chapter, Substance-Related Disorders, has been renamed Substance Use and Addictive Disorders. Why did they add the phrase addictive disorders? Because for the first time in DSM history, um, a non-substance addiction has been um, thrown into the same chapter as substance use disorders. Specifically, what we used to call in DSM-4 pathological gambling has been renamed a less pejorative gambling disorder. And because of the similarities in underlying neurobiology, gambling disorder has been lumped in with substance use disorders. The science is there. The brain science is there, so that's why they made this change. Now, I personally define an addiction as any behavior that a person repeatedly engages in that activates reward circuitry in the brain despite significant negative consequences in major life areas. And in that sense, um, the way that I conceptualize addiction, gambling disorder certainly fits there to me, along with several other things that are not in that chapter. But then again, by the way, one of my bias, uh, biases is that I'm uh, my the beginning of my career was in um, entirely substance abuse treatment. So the chapter Schizophrenia and Other Psychotic Disorders has been renamed Schizophrenia Spectrum and Other Psychotic Disorders. Again, we're moving to a spectrum classification system. The old mood disorders chapter, which used to include both bipolar and depressive disorders, um, has been deleted and more or less split into two separate chapters. They have separated bipolar and depressive disorders. Now, on one hand, that's unfortunate because the way that you, you differential, differentially diagnose depressive and bipolar disorders deals a lot with determining, okay, do we have manic or hypomanic episodes? Do we have depressive episodes? So in that sense, it was kind of convenient to have them lumped together. But the reality is, again, brain science now. The very thing that the DSM-5 was criticized by NIMH for, this is an example of them actually doing good in that area. Um, they, the, the research is very clear that bipolar disorder, disorder on a biological and genetic level has much more in common with psychotic disorders like schizophrenia than it does with depressive disorders. So it makes much more sense from an underlying systems mentality to separate those two. And in fact, bipolar disorders has been moved right next to schizophrenia 
Spectrum Disorders chapter. The uh, Sexual and Gender Identity Disorders chapter has been broken into three separate chapters, Sexual Dysfunctions, Gender Dysphoria, and Paraphilic Disorder. Why did they do that? Well, think about this. What do sexual dysfunctions have to do with things like gender dysphoria? Um, I mean, what does premature ejaculation have to do with gender identity, for example? They've got nothing in common with each other except this, that for some reason, anything that made us think even remotely about sex, we threw together into one, like, dirty sex chapter or something like that. Completely inaccurate um, and doesn't make a lot of sense conceptually. These disorders are too different from each other to be in the same chapter, so they've been split into separate chapters. It seems very appropriate to me. Um, I'm going to offer you my opinions throughout this, but I'm going to be clear that when they're my opinions and not facts. Adjustment disorders. The adjustment disorders chapter has been deleted. Now, I think everywhere people are clutching their pearls and with their mouths open in horror because adjustment disorders are a very popular diagnosis for those of us who work with managed care. No worries. They haven't got rid of adjustment disorders. We still have adjustment disorders. They've just been moved. They've been moved to the trauma and stress-related disorders chapter, again, because of the spectrum um, classification system. More or less, what do adjustment disorders have in common with trauma disorders like PTSD or acute stress disorder? Well, they all involve an individual's reaction or response to psychosocial stressors in their environment. That is the underlying variable with all of these disorders. So adjustment disorders can now be conceptualized as more like a milder form of a trauma disorder. And so they're all in the same chapter now. The old chapter that used to be titled Other Conditions that May Be a Focus of Clinical Attention um, has now been renamed Other Mental Disorders. Again, I like the more succinct verbiage. Now let's get into the nitty gritty details to the disorders themselves within these chapters. I'm going to move through in the same order that these disorders appear in the DSM-5. I'm going to de-emphasize disorders that you as mental health counselors are probably less interested in. Like, I'll spend less time on the neurodevelopmental and neurocognitive stuff and the sleep disorders, not because those things aren't important, but because we have limited time today, and I think I know what you would rather focus on, based on feedback I've gotten in previous um, trainings anyway with mental health counselors. So that term mental retardation, which has become a very pejorative term, has now been renamed intellectual disability, or they put in parentheses the ICD, the new ICD label for it, which is intellectual developmental disorder. Um, a big difference here is that we used to determine severity of um, an intellectual disability based on IQ score, mild, moderate, severe, and profound, but now, They've said, no, IQ score is not the best predictor. First of all, as many of you know, IQ scores aren't necessarily culturally sensitive. And um, there are some limitations to IQ scores being accurate and valid. Um, they have gotten much more sensible, I think. You now determine severity based on their level of adaptive functioning, not by the IQ score itself. Now, you always had to assess both to make the diagnosis, but severity is now determined by functioning. That makes more sense to me as a clinician. How is the person functioning in the context of their environment and society? That's more important to me than the number of their IQ score. That's my opinion. So uh, let's see here. Communication disorders, I'm not going to really talk about these. Not huge differences. They renamed some stuff. They combined a few things. You're probably not as interested in these disorders. But I will say something about a new di diagnosis, social pragmatic communication disorder. This disorder um, will capture some people who used to be Asperger's, but not most of them, probably. Um, basically, autism essentially involves two different um, components. Component number one is difficulties with social communication. Um, category number two deals more with these repetitive, rest restrictive routines and behaviors. And if somebody has only one but not two, then they will probably end up with social pragmatic communication disorder. If they have both, they'd be on the autistic spectrum. Speaking of which, um, four different disorders, autism, Asperger's, um, childhood disintegrative disorder, and PDD, were all essentially determined to be the same thing, more or less, 
with the only difference being severity. So in keeping with the DSM-5 paradigm shift, where similar disorders are merged together and then spectrums are created within that category, we will see that all four of these are now one diagnosis, autism spectrum disorder. We now have specifiers. They're called levels, level one, two, and three. And those three levels are based on what level of support does the individual need. And there's plenty of guidance in the DSM for how you figure out those different levels. Well, this has raised a big stink about, well, will some folks be left out? Will there be people who used to be Asperger's, for example, that now, long, that now are no longer anything? Well, in all of the research, all of the trials and studies leading to the adoption of the new diagnosis, um, that was determined statistically to not be the case, that people were not being left out. And just to be extra reassuring, the DSM actually specifically denotes, look, if somebody used to have this diagnosis, they need to still have this diagnosis, to paraphrase. Now let's move into ADHD, which some of you are probably very interested in. Um, there have been some extra, they give more examples in the diagnostic criteria to help you picture what do these symptoms manifest, what will it look like in the real world? How will you be able to tell if this symptom is actually met or not? So that's pretty cool. I like the examples they've added. They now have um, taken what in the DSM-4, they had a cross-situational requirement that basically said, look, you have to have, um, you know, these symptoms have to be present in more than one um, setting, and they've strengthened that concept. Um, with the DSM-5. Again, the idea here is not to over-diagnose, not to over-pathologize. We want to make sure that, I mean, if they're only ADHD in class, but they're not ADHD in other tasks or activities that involve similar levels and forms of stimulation, then maybe the problem isn't ADHD. Maybe they're not being intellectually challenged enough in class, for example. That's not a deficit. So um, they're trying to avoid over-diagnosing ADHD. So again, one of the criticisms of the DSM-5, over-pathologizing, but here's a clear example of depathologizing. But then again, they used to say that you had to have, the symptoms had to be present prior to the age of seven for the diagnosis. They've changed that to before age 12. They didn't do that to over-pathologize. They did that because, uh, number one, many people, we don't have records or accurate information prior to age 12. The probability they could have had symptoms at the age of six, but we just don't know about it, or they don't remember it, or whatever else. So they wanted it to be a little bit more clear cut. And in fact, kids who have these symptoms at age 12, you know, their the symptoms aren't going away if they truly meet the diagnostic criteria anytime soon. So it seems very valid that they would still get the diagnosis. Uh, ADHD. The uh, let's see here. Anything else? Oh, this is a big one. I, I want to emphasize. ADHD can now be diagnosed concurrent with autistic spectrum disorder. I don't know much about why that is or anything, and uh, there's some controversy about that, but it is the case. We do have a severity rating now. Remember, um, we want to get more, less dichotomous, more of the um, multidimensional sort of assessment, more of a spectrum system. So we see that we now have mild, moderate, and severe ADHD. Four different learning disorders have been merged into one learning disorder um, because most of the time people have more than one, dis one learning disorder. And then you just specify in your diagnosis which areas the person has the deficits. And um, also, again, to depathologize, avoid overdiagnosis, they have added an emphasis on intervention-based diagnosis. Basically, you can't diagnose somebody with a learning disability unless you've intervened for at least six months to make sure they have appropriate opportunity to remediate. And only if they are consistently unable to do so despite their efforts and despite access to appropriate intervention could you make the diagnosis. That's big. That's going to avoid overdiagnosing learning disorders. I'll give you an example of how this might play out. When I moved from, uh, when I was a kid, I moved from Palmetto to St. Pete in the first grade. And um, it was halfway through the year that I made the move. Well, when I got to the first grade, they had covered math already when I was in Palmetto that I never got exposed to. We just hadn't gotten to that lesson yet. So I got there, and I was behind on math. I was, like, underperforming in math. Um, but, and so they remediated. They actually gave me tutoring outside of class, brought my math up to where it should be. I was good to go. 
avoided diagnosing me with a learning disorder when all I needed was appropriate intervention. So again, depathologizing, avoiding overdiagnosis. Here's another good example. All right, so let's not talk about motor disorders because you're probably not very interested in those anyway. We don't have a lot of time. Um, schizophrenia, though, might want to mention a few things here. Bizarre delusions no longer get to be special. They just get to be delusions like all the other delusions. Um, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And the Schneiderian symptoms, the things like two or more voices conversing with each other at once, um, not, not a big deal anymore because, because people with or without those features will still respond to the same kinds of interventions and so forth. Um, oh, this is interesting. Schizotypal personality disorder is actually listed in the schizophrenia chapter. It appears in two chapters now, both the personality disorder chapter and the schizophrenia spectrum disorder chapter, and that was meant, again, to respect neurobiology. Um, there's a lot in common between schizotypal personality disorder and um, the schizophrenia spectrum disorders. It may be sort of thought of as being on the spectrum. That seems to be the indication here. Uh, new requirement that individuals to be diagnosed with schizophrenia have to have at least one positive symptom. That's to avoid, again, overdiagnosing or to avoid um, overpathologizing abnorm abnormality. So they have to have delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech. They eliminated all those little subtypes like paranoid, disorganized, catatonic, and so forth for several reasons. Number one, almost everybody got diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. But number two, really didn't seem to make a hill of beans when it came to um, interventions. Um, schizoaffective disorder, some uh, new requirement that a major mood episode must be present for majority of the disorder's total duration after criterion A symptoms of schizophrenia have been met. They did this to help you with differential diagnosis to be able to tell schizoaffective apart from schizophrenia with a concurrent depressive disorder a little bit more easily. Um, let's see here. Let's, we got schizoaffective disorder subtypes. Oh, catatonia, by the way, can, is now a specifier for different disorders. Um, you can add it as a specifier for psychotic disorders, bipolar disorders, depressive disorders, and even other medical disorders. And it can, uh, okay, so we covered that. And it's also its own separate diagnosis. It's another option. Let's get into bipolar disorders. You're probably interested in that. Um, not a lot has changed at the core of bipolar disorders. We still have the same essential features and symptoms and so forth, but there are some changes that, that mean a lot conceptually, I think. First thing is that they've changed the verbiage in criterion A for manic and hypomanic episodes. So the verbiage now emphasizes not just changes in mood, but also changes in activity and energy. They did this again to depathologize. Many people have been inaccurately diagnosed as being bipolar. Mood, mood changes aren't enough for bipolar disorder. You need to have the changes in activity and energy, not just mood, sh mood shifts. How many people have I seen who are really borderline, um, really have borderline personality disorder that are being misdiagnosed bipolar disorder? But their shifts from mania to depression occur in like an hour's time, not in like days or weeks time. So it's an inaccurate label in many cases, and people have been overdiagnosed with it. So they, they added that to help you differentiate. We used to have a separate diagnosis for bipolar 1 disorder mixed episode. It's now not a separate diagnosis. It's bipolar disorder just like regular bipolar disorder. Um, it's just that you can now add a specifier at the end, comma, with mixed features. Now, you don't have to determine if the person simultaneously is experiencing the full criteria for a depressive episode and the full criteria for a manic episode at once, which, by the way, used to take tons of time and would be hard to even figure out because usually the client's not a very good historian about the time frames of those symptoms. But furthermore, it didn't really matter. All that matters is that you know that they have smatterings of both concurrent. That's what's important from a treatment standpoint. So they got rid of considering a separate diagnosis, and it's easier to determine if they have the specifier with mixed features than um, it would have been to determine if they had a true full mixed episode. 
we now get a new diagnosis, other specified bipolar and related disorder, and we've got the unspecified as well. I already told you about those. We have a new um, specifier. You can tack on to the end of your bipolar disorder with anxious distress. That means, and there are specific criterion for this stuff that we won't have time to go over, but the specific criteria um, aside, basically it means that the person has some anxiety symptoms that warrant clinical attention and that are coming along for the ride and that we need to treat and focus on, yet they do not meet the criteria for a full standalone anxiety disorder. Unfortunately, diagnosticians would be tempted to diagnose a separate anxiety disorder in those cases, even if the person doesn't truly have a standalone anxiety disorder. They just have some anxiety that comes along with their bipolar disorder. So again, we're trying to cut down on the number of diagnoses and the over-pathologizing, but yet still be descriptive and still allow for intervention when appropriate. So it's now a specifier with anxious distress. Now depressive disorders, we're going to see some very significant changes here. These are big. And some of the more controversial changes um, we'll see in the depressive disorders chapter as well. First of all, we get a new diagnosis. That new diagnosis is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. It is for children only. You cannot diagnose it 18 and above. This diagnosis is for children who are persistently irritable and dysphoric and who um, have age inappropriate um, temper tantrums frequently and across environments and so forth and require have significant impairment of distress and require intervention. What they found is that children who are depressed um, are going to be more likely to show irritability than the traditional sadness and despair that adults are more likely to experience. And they were being mislabeled bipolar. Um, there was something crazy, like a 40-fold increase in bipolar diagnoses for children over a 10-year span, according to, to research. And so it's clear that we were over-diagnosing bipolar and inaccurately diagnosing it. And many of these children, when they were adults, lo and behold, no mania, no hypomania. Obviously, it was an inaccurate diagnosis. So they have a new diagnosis for it, and it's a depressive disorder, because what's really going on with those kids is they're really depressed but the depression manifests itself because of their hormonal imbalances at that age um, period, that developmental period, as irritability rather than sad, down, or depressed mood. Nonetheless, the criticism is, oh, now we're pathologizing temper tantrums. That is not the case. Look at the diagnostic criteria. It's very clear we're not talking about age-appropriate temper tantrums. Um, the second new diagnosis is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Now, my disclaimer here is I lack some credibility right off the bat because I have not had any personal experiences with menstruation. So I am already less qualified to speak to, attest to the process of normal and abnormal men menstruation and so forth. Um, I have observed things and I have read stuff, but that's all I got to go on. Um, well, premenstrual dysphoric disorder basically is applies to about, I think it's 3 to 5% of women who have extremely abnormal mood swings, not typical mood swings connected to the typical healthy um, menstruation cycle, but in the week of onset of menses and then shortly thereafter, they will have extremely wide mood swings that will cause clinically significant impairment or distress. Now, people are concerned that we could be pathologizing normal female experiences. Again, statistically, that's not the case. And when you read the diagnostic criteria, maybe it'll look clear to you that we're not. But I certainly agree that clinicians could, miss, um, could misapply this new diagnostic label. Now, on a personal note, or maybe more a clinical note, a, an N of two, I had two female clients that convinced me of the legitimacy of this new diagnosis um, because I was very skeptical about it. One client had an extreme had a DUI, um, and to make a long story short, she would, in the week of onset of menses, have incredible depression, anger, irritability, anxiety. She would be unable to work. She lost a job. She um, had some suicide attempts, got Baker acted. DUI would self-medicate with alcohol during this period and attempt to balance out, which only made things worse. She would not normally have any of these symptoms. They were clearly and intimately connected to her menstrual cycle. Okay. Suicidality, job loss, aggression and violence, 
alcohol abuse, all of them intimately connected to the menstruation cycle. My understanding is that is not normal for a woman to experience to that degree. So she said, look, the first two psychiatrists I went to didn't take it seriously. They said, this is just women's PMS stuff. But she said, I went to a third psychiatrist who was a female and who is, is a specialist in this area. And that third psychiatrist said, no, clearly this is not normal um, menstrual um, processes that you're experiencing and used a treatment of um, antidepressant medication and some hormonal treatments. And lo and behold, the client did okay during those periods of onset of menses again. So she wouldn't have been able to access that treatment, at least not through insurance, had it not been a disorder. So here's something to think about. Um, they kind of sold me on it. That's just my opinion. Two disorders, dysthymic disorder, major depressive disorder, chronic, um, the only difference between the two was, again, severity. So in keeping with the DSM-5 paradigm shift, we have simplified it. They are now one disorder called persistent depressive disorder with a spectrum of severity ranging from mild to severe. Makes sense. Fits with the paradigm shift. Again, we have that new with mixed features uh, specifier that you had for bipolar disorders. You can use it with depressive disorders as well. Here's a controversy. There used to be an exclusion in the DSM-4. You could not say that somebody met the criteria for a major depressive episode if they were grieving a loved one who they had lost within two months, if I remember correctly. They got rid of that exclusion. And so the concern is, well, now are we pathologizing normal human grief? The retort to that, the answer to that, I think, or the rebuttal is that is actually several points. Point number one, the vast majority of people who grieve the loss of a loved one do not experience, the, yes, they experience sadness and depression and so forth. They do not, however, experience the diagnostic criteria for a major depressive episode. The vast majority do not. So it's, it's abnormal in that sense. Now, who are the people who do? The people who do tend to be people who have a biological predisposition towards depressive disorders, many of whom have a history of major depressive episodes not connected to grief. So it appears that these folks, what's more accurately happening is they have the genetic predisposition for depression. They're vulnerable towards depression. And the grief triggers a depressive episode. For somebody who's had depressive episodes triggered by other things at various points in their life. So that's justification number one. Justification number two is that it implied that grief, we should be over grief within two months, which is certainly not the case statistically. Justification number three is that um, these people can benefit from treatment. They benefit from talk therapy and in some cases medication. In some cases, I mean, they're severe, they're suicidal and things. That warrants some attention. And furthermore, they, they do well with treatment, the same treatment interventions as anybody else who has depression. A final justification is that it seems weird to not make exceptions for other major losses. Okay, so if I lose a loved one, I get an exception. If I lose my career, my house, nothing. If I lose my faith in God, nothing. If I lose whatever, um, nothing. If I lose a limb, um, we don't have an exclusion for loss of a limb or something. So hey, there were a lot of justifications given for why they got rid of the exclusion, but nonetheless, it is controversial, and I see the point on both sides. Let's go to anxiety disorders. We used to have obsessive compulsive disorders and PTSD and acute stress disorder in this chapter. No longer. They have been moved into separate chapters. Again, this is the DSM-5's attempt to pay homage to neurobiology um, and similarities in an underlying symptom manifestation. What else do we get here? Um, so it used to be that for several anxiety disorders, in order to diagnose the disorder, you had to be able to say that the person recognizes that their anxiety is excessive or unreasonable. So they have to have good insight. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. So if I have all the symptoms of an anxiety disorder, but I have poor insight, I am not disordered all of a sudden, and I actually maybe even more disordered than somebody who has good insight. So they no longer have to recognize that the anxiety is excessive or unreasonable. Um, you can still make the diagnosis now. Um, we used to say that 
um, for only those under the age of 18, they had to have the symptoms for at least six months for specific phobias. That has now been extended to all people to minimize diagnosis of transient fears, again, to depathologize abnormality and make sure that this is really a disorder and not just a temporary experience. There are some minor verbiage changes with panic attacks, and we have unlinked panic disorder and agoraphobia. This is a good move, in my opinion, because the research shows that there are many people who are agoraphobic and suffering tremendously because of it, yet they do not have panic attacks or panic disorder, at least. So they used to get no diagnosis because you could only diagnose agoraphobia in conjunction with panic disorder in the DSM-4. But now they're unlinked. You can diagnose agoraphobia as a separate standalone disorder. Some changes in verbiage and social phobia. This is an interesting one. Separation anxiety disorder um, can now be diagnosed with adults. Now, I personally have a client who is an adult who I have diagnosed with separation anxiety disorder. She clearly meets the symptoms, clearly causes clinically significant impairment or stress, clearly benefits from therapeutic intervention. Um, selective mutism has been recruited into anxiety disorders from the old childhood disorder chapter. And that's a, this would be the scenario where a kid, let's say a child moves to a new environment, and they're in a new state, maybe in a new school, and they don't ever speak in school, won't open their mouth, won't say anything. But at home they talk, they just won't at school. Well, that seems to be very much related to anxiety, so they thought this would be a good place to park it. We get some new disorders that are now categorized as obsessive compulsive disorders. Hoarding disorders, so those of you who have been watching the reality TV shows, congratulations, it's now a diagnosis. Excoriation or skin picking disorder, this is a really interesting one. I had a um, classmate in junior high who uh, she, she would unfortunately, she would pick at her skin compulsively throughout class. It would create scabs, bleeding, and so forth. She would be tremendously ostracized by the other girls in school because of it. It was nasty, and I felt pretty bad for her, frankly speaking. And she wanted to stop, and, and she couldn't. Well, now there's a diagnosis for it, and so maybe somebody like that would be able to access treatment or it would be recognized in them when they previously didn't have intervention. I don't know. All right, moving along. Trichotillomania has been recruited from the impulse control disorder into disorder chapter into the OCD chapter. Again, the DSM-5 is paying homage to um, new developments in neuroscience with that. Obsessive compulsive and related disorders, we used to have in the DSM-4 this old um, with poor insight specifier that you could tack on to the end of your diagnosis. You now can say with good or fair insight um, or with absent or delusional beliefs. So more options to be more descriptive within the diagnosis of what's happening with the client in front of you. Nothing too big with body dysmorphic disorder. Um, we are getting more specific with the um, language in PTSD and acute stress disorder for what are the qualifying traumatic events that the person experienced. Now you are probably well aware of this, but the events can be experienced directly, witnessed, or indirectly experienced. Case study. I worked with a client who um, came to me because of a, a DUI. A very high alcohol level, was abusing alcohol for a substantial chunk of time in her life. The, in this case, the alcohol abuse was not, in my opinion, more reflective of a standalone alcohol use disorder. It was more an attempt to self-medicate against PTSD. How did my client get PTSD? Well, in the aftermath of 9-11, now let me back up. She was not in New York City during 9-11. She didn't have any friends or family there. Um, she didn't get traumatized until well after the event itself. Because her job, she took a new job in New York City, and in this job, she had to listen to 911 audio recordings from that day and transcribe them so that there would be a full um, script of every call. So day after day, minute after mi minute, hour after hour, week after week, month after month, she got listened to call. She would listen to call after call of tra of trauma people dying, screaming, screeching, and agony and pain, people burning to death, people saying their last goodbyes to loved ones, people 
describing decapitated heads, all kinds of stuff. And she did this day after day, and she listened to those traumatic pleas for help. Got PTSD. Indirect, um, um, indirectly witnessed the trauma of, of 911 would be a way to think of that, or 911. Okay, so they also removed, they used to say, have a criterion under PTSD that specified that the person had to um, ex respond with intense fear, helplessness, or horror to the trauma. They got rid of that because, especially for veterans, um, service members are unlikely to sense, perceive, or report that they responded with intense fear, helplessness, or horror yet nonetheless meet the other symptoms and are clearly traumatized. So actually the VA and, and the veterans health movement were a big part of um, advocating for this change to the criteria successfully. Um, not the, a couple things to be more developmentally sensitive with PTSD. Let's move on. Reactive attachment disorder um, has now been split into two separate disorders. Now I know that's the opposite of what DSM is doing with most disorders, where they're merging disorders together, but in this case, again, it's paying homage to underlying neurobiology and to differences in symptom manifestation, because what we used to have is one reactive attachment disorder that had two subtypes, emotionally withdrawn or inhibited, and indiscriminately social or disinhibited. So this would be like the emotionally withdrawn would be the um, the child who is not even securely attaching to their their caregivers in developmentally appropriate ways, because usually of early childhood traumas. But the other subtype, indiscriminately social or disinhibited, were the direct opposite. This would be like maybe you go to pick up your your daughter at at daycare. And then some little boy runs up to you, and the little boy like attaches himself to your leg and is like hugging on to you, and starts talking about you know your shoes are pretty, and I like SpongeBob, and um, that's a really cool hat, and will you take me home with you? And you've never seen this kid before in your life, um, so they had them together because both tended to have early childhood trauma as a cause. But the, what was happening within their systems, and therefore what was happening with their symptoms, were very different conceptually, so it made sense to separate them in that sense. And the treatment can be very different, too. Nothing too big with dissociative disorders. Some culturally sensitive stuff, they added some verbiage um, to include um, cultural manifestations of the disorder, like, for example, demon possession. Um, what used to be two separate disorders, somatization disorder and undifferentiated somatoform disorder, have now been merged into one somatic symptom disorder. And um, uh, let's see, what else do we want to say? Oh, hypochondriasis no longer exists. Now, it's not that the disorder no longer exists, but the name no longer exists. The people who used to have hypochondriasis would go into one of two categories. Most of them will go into the somatic symptom disorder category, that new diagnosis. That would be if their um, intense anxiety connected to their health is connected to actual symptoms that they're experiencing. If that is not the case, if they just have you know, over-the-board anxiety about their health but they have no symptoms, then they would go into a new disorder called illness anxiety disorder. I have a colleague who refers to this as Woody Allen syndrome. Pain disorder, um, the verbiage now implies less emphasis on separating like real physical pain from psychological pain because they're the same. Pain is a psychological phenomenon. Pain is generated in the brain, not in the body, even though it feels like it's coming from the body. And pain's real, regardless of whether there's an actual injury that we can connect it to or not. Um, the pain is nonetheless a real phenomenon. Feeding and eating disorders, um, nothing too big here. It, until we get to binge eating disorder, that new diagnosis, I told you about it earlier. Basically, it's bulimia without the recurrent inappropriate compensatory behaviors like purging and driven exercise. These people used to get eating disorder NOS labels. So this is another attempt to stop it with the overuse of NOS and to be more descriptive of what's happening with the individual in front of you in the diagnostic label.
Um, we're not going to talk really about sleep-wake disorders for t purposes of time. Um, I will quickly mention that what, what they've done to summarize it is that there are a lot of new disorders in the sleep-wake disorders chapter. They're not really new disorders. They're just new to the DSM. They're disorders that neurologists have been di diagnosing for probably decades, if not centuries. Um, but they just weren't in the DSM until now. Well, there's a turf war going on right now between psychiatrists and neurologists over sleep disorders. And essentially the position of psychiatry is, look, we both are in the business in our own ways of treating sleep disorders. So we need to, um, instead of having a thousand sleep disorder NOS diagnoses that psychiatrists are using, we need to be specific about these disorders um, and we need to therefore recruit the disorders that neurologists use. That's the short description. Uh, yeah, minor changes with sexual dysfunctions. Dyspareunia and, and vaginismus are now merged into one genitopelvic pain or penetration disorder. I don't know why. That's a mouthful right there. Duration requirement has been updated to six months minimum for all sexual dysfunctions. That is to, again, depathologize. Make sure that it's a real disorder by looking at how long these symptoms are lasting. Gender dysphoria, another example of depathologizing. There is a movement to try and get gender dysphoria out of the DSM altogether, but we used to call it, in the DSM-4, it was called gender identity disorder. But the, the movement seems to be in the direction of, look, their, their gender dysphoria is not necessarily a, a disorder. It's more like um, an abnormality, and we should be that we should be depathologizing like we depathologized. Um, well, even abnormality is not necessarily the right phrase. It's just basically an, an incongruence between um, the individual's identity and their biological sex, their sense of gender and their biological sex. Um, but we should think of it more like sexual orientation. It's merely a variation um, of normalcy rather than a, than a disorder. We may see it comes out of the DSM in the future and that we might consider it more like a stressor-related disorder in the future um, than a, a gender dysphoria disorder per se. That's the short version of it. There's a longer explanation. In fact, I have a longer explanation right here, but um, we can move on. Disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. Um, some spectrums have been added. Um, we have a spectrum for oppositional defiant disorder, and we have some new subtypes, like with angry or irritable mood, argumentative or defiant behavior, and vindictiveness. Um, here's a, an interesting change. There's a new specifier that you can tack on to the end of conduct disorder that's called with limited prosocial emotions. Now, this is actually an important specifier. This would be the kid who, for example, really does not empathize. Yes, I shot the kid's eye out with the BB gun. He deserves it. He has another eye anyway, serves him right. And zero empathy, regret, compassion, remorse. Unfortunately, these children are substantially more likely to develop antisocial personality disorder as adults. And unfortunately, the prognosis is worse for them in terms of recovery. Meanwhile, there are other kids who meet criteria for conic disorder, who actually are very treatable and respond well to intervention and, and have a lot of pro-social emotions. So it's, a, it's an important specifier to consider. And also antisocial personality disorder is now listed in two places. It's listed in this chapter to illustrate its connection to childhood conduct disorder. And then it's separately um, listed in the personality disorder chapter, just like we saw with schizoaffective personality disorder, or I'm sorry, schizotypal personality disorder. What else do we get here? Um, let's not deal with that. Oh, here's an important question. So I used to get this frequently asked question in presentations, what about sexual addiction? Well, there was actually a task force that was created to, to propose a sexual addiction diagnosis for the DSM-5. Unfortunately, there was a tremendous amount of infighting. It was an international team, and they could not come to consensus, so they, they disband, and they're going to park it, and then we'll see if future generations will tackle this um, apparently very challenging task. 
So the question is, well, what do I diagnose in the meantime? Well, me personally, in the DSM-4, I used to always diagnose impulse control disorder, NOS, for sexual addiction. But now in the DSM-5, you would diagnose other specified disruptive impulse control and conduct disorder, and then, like in keeping with the other specified requirement that you now list why it is that the person doesn't neatly fit into the diagnosis, I tack on to the end, sexual addiction, or you could say non-purophilic sexual disorder. And um, this comes straight from the task force as a temporary stance. Told you about gambling disorder already. Big changes with substance use disorders. The big changes are that when you look at DSM-4, substance abuse and substance dependence, again, we're essentially the same thing differing only in terms of severity. So again, DSM-5 paradigm shift, merge them into one disorder, create a spectrum of severity from mild to severe based on the number of symptoms that the person has. They have removed their substance, the recurrent substance related really legal problems criterion, and they did that for two reasons. One of them is it serves no predictive validity because anyone who meets that symptom meets other symptoms on the list. But justification number two is to be culturally sensitive. Well, that may sound strange. What does it have to do with culture? Well, this is how it has to do with culture. If I were walking down a street near a school and I happened to have marijuana in my pocket and I were a black male, statistically, I'm going to be more likely to be caught with that marijuana. And number two, if caught, more likely to actually be charged for it. So because of biases in our culture, it doesn't make sense to them to have a criterion that is tied intimately to areas that could involve changes in cultural um, you know, biases. So they got rid of the legal requirement for that reason as well. But they've increased the threshold in DSM-4, you only needed one symptom to get a diagnosis of abuse. But to get the new merged substance use disorder diagnosis, you need at least two symptoms. And this should help to strengthen the validity of the concept of the disorder itself. At least that is the idea. Cannabis withdrawal and caffeine withdrawal have both been added as diagnoses in the DSM-5. I think that's great. The research has been clear since the 70s that for chronic daily long-term marijuana users, um, there are clear and consistent symptoms that they experience when they withdraw that tend to clear up within about a month's time. This also does good work on the myth that marijuana is not addictive. That is absolutely not the case, to make a long story short. Nicotine abuse um, did not exist in the DSM-4. You only had nicotine dependence. This created a problem because in some scenarios, someone would have maybe, say, two symptoms of dependence and one of abuse, and they would get no diagnosis. And, or they could have three symptoms of abuse and get no diagnosis of nicotine abuse. But that problem is eliminated in the DSM-5 because we now have tobacco use disorder, which uses the same exact criteria as everybody else. So it's very consistent. I think that's cool because smoking is a number one cause of preventable death in our country. Let's take it seriously. Um, remission used to be in the DSM-4 that you could consider someone in remission from a substance use disorder if they had not experienced any symptoms for a minimum of a month. But now they must have not experienced symptoms for a minimum of three months. And um, the rationale is that, the, is again, this is neurobiology research, neuroscience. The brain is still chemically regulating in substantial ways during those first 90 days. People are at high risk of relapse. They are very chemically imbalanced. Um, so it doesn't make sense to say they're in remission yet. That's why NIDA and NIAAA recommend that no treatment, whether outpatient or residential, ever be provided for a period of time less than 90 days. Um, also, I forgot to tell you, there's a new symptom that was added, which is craving. So they dropped one symptom from DSM-4, but they added a new one, craving, a strong desire or urge to use. Go figure that that was not in there before. Now, craving is an exception when it comes to remission. If the person's gone for three months without any symptoms, but they are still experiencing craving, you can still say they're in remission. They got rid of these specifiers with or without physiological dependence. Why? Because again, the paradigm shift away from mind-body dualism. 
There is no difference between physiological dependence and psychological dependence. They're not two magically different realms. They are one and the same. There's tremendous overlap between them. So we need to be less dichotomous in that sense is the shift. The old diagnosis polysubstance dependence has now been eliminated. There is no polysubstance anything in the DSM-5. Personally, I like this even though it is not very convenient for people who don't have a lot of time when they're diagnosing because polysubstance dependence in the DSM-4 was rarely used accurately. It should have been an extremely rare diagnosis um, reserved for scenarios where a person does not meet diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder based on any one substance. But if you combine three or more substances together, then they do meet the criteria for dependence. But most of the time people really used it when the person had a lot of symptoms and had used a lot of substances. They would just slap polysub on there and call it a day without um, doing a, a more in-depth differential diagnostic process. So that's gone. You don't have that convenience anymore. So to summarize, um, they got rid of the recurrent legal problems symptom and then they added craving. Now this eliminates a problem called diagnostic orphans. What, what, what are diagnostic orphans? Well, in the DSM-4, you can have a scenario where someone meets two symptoms of dependence and zero symptoms of abuse, or at least to your knowledge, that is the case. Technically, they would get no diagnosis because they have nothing for abuse and they need three or more for dependence, so they get nothing. They slipped under the diagnostic radar. Meanwhile, someone else has just one symptom of abuse and they're in, so this gets rid of, we call those diagnostic orphans, the DSM-5 eliminates that problem. They also reordered or restructured the order of the symptoms to fit into conceptual categories here. Impaired control, social impairment, risk use, and finally, pharmacological criteria. Now by the way, there is a new controversial exception for amphetamines, opioids, and sedatives or hypnotics like benzos and barbiturates and so forth. You cannot count symptoms 10 and 11 for those three categories if they are legally prescribed medications that are being taken within their prescribed parameters. You can count other symptoms on this list, but you cannot count 10 and 11 because those will naturally happen just by the person taking the medication for an extended period of time, even if um, they're, the medication is doing more benefit than harm. And that's a little controversial, but I understand the rationale for it as well. Um, so now the big question has been, especially people in the recovery community, they're like, well, hold on. This new substance use disorder, won't that sort of undermine the concept of addiction? Because, for example, people in AA, if they saw somebody with alcohol abuse but not alcohol dependence, they might be prone to saying, well, that person's not a real alcoholic. Um, they might, in fact, they might be able to learn how to responsibly drink, whereas a real alcoholic cannot responsibly drink. That's the mentality, the traditional mentality anyway in the recovery community. So they're worried that people who used to be abusers are now going to be in the same diagnostic, the same diagnosis as people who used to be dependent or considered dependent. So a couple of things about that. Number one, remember they increased the number of symptoms you have to meet. So it's now a minimum of two. That might strengthen the validity of the diagnosis a little bit. The other thing is um, you have a spectrum. So what used to be alcohol abuse is now more or less mild alcohol use disorder. What used to be alcohol dependence is now more or less moderate to severe alcohol use disorder. So you still can, you know, if you really want to be dichotomous, you can still be dichotomous is the, the bottom line. Neurocognitive disorders I will not focus on because you're probably less interested in these as mental health counselors. But they did take uh, dementia and amnestic disorders. They now have one combined major neurocognitive disorder, and then they have a new mild neurocognitive disorder, which, used, which will get rid of a lot of the cognitive disorder NOS diagnoses. I already told you um, about the new personality disorder model. Actually, I incorrectly labeled it earlier. I called it the hybrid multidimensional model. It's actually the hybrid dimensional categorical model. So there you go.
it hasn't been adopted adapted adopted into the DSM-5 except that it is in section 3 I would start studying it and getting used to it because I, it's going to happen I feel very um, uh, confident about that paraphilic disorders now by the way they changed the name it's not paraphilias it's now paraphilic disorders why because you're entitled to your paraphilias you want to have a paraphilia and that does it for you and it just sparks that twinkle in your eye have your paraphilia but it's not disordered unless it's causing you or other people in, in your environment clinically significant impairment or distress so the the paraphilia is not a disorder they do not want to over pathologize so they took some measures to try and um, clarify that so that concludes our review of section two now we have enough time for me to spend about 15 minutes I think telling you about section three and resources and in the final 15 minutes of our webinar we can use for questions and answers so assessment measures um, more or less they've created the APA's created some tools that you can use now to implement DSM-5 and they're using the same kind of philosophy that your primary care physician would use that philosophy is um, if you come in for your annual exam your primary care doc isn't going to ask you every question about every disorder in the world you would never get out of the place they're going to ask you a small number of questions that are specifically designed to um, to determine whether you could potentially have a disorder in a specific category and then the last follow-up questions if they get a hit on level one so to speak they'll move on to level two well we can do the same thing with mental disorders um, they have created a tool that I'll tell you more about with that um, and the assessment measures also includes the HUDAS is in the DSM and the cultural formulation interview which I really like it asks questions like to help you be more culturally sensitive when you're diagnosing so it'll ask questions like you know what do your friends and family say about this problem what does your priest pastor rabbi imam whoever say about this problem um, in your neighborhood what do people think about this those kinds of things I really like it these are the um, the baby diagnoses that may graduate in the DSM-6 we'll see um, I won't spend time on them because they weren't adopted but they are cool things if we had more time I would tell you more about them but let's spend some time on resources the first resource because I'm a big fan of free stuff I think we pay for a lot of things um, I'd like to give you some free stuff too so if you go to the website dsm5.org actually let's not even do that let's start by going to my website and let us go to uh, it's anorton.com and you would click on resources and then once you click on resources you would click on counselor resource page and then finally DSM-5 resource page and what I give you on this is several things number one a three-part video series of a presentation that I co-presented with Dr. Henry Tenenbaum for the University of South Florida on DSM-5 update it is already outdated there have been changes even since we did that in January 2014 um, but uh, it's still some good information I think and then there are some handouts I would recommend this slide DSM-5 update for mental health professionals is essentially the same thing that I gave you today only a little bit more extended actually and here's one on just bipolar because I do a whole presentation on that insurance and third-party payers um, update for forensic evaluators using ACM and DSM-5 so those are all presentations I give that I give you the free PDF files for this is something I really want to draw your attention to DSM-5 online assessment measures if you click on that you will go to a DSM-5 page and this is the system I told you about level one cross-cutting symptom measures you could give this to your clients to fill out in the lobby before they see you for their first appointment especially if they're insurance clients I think insurance companies love this stuff because it's quantifying things and then click on if it's an adult you're going to click on DSM-5 self-rated level one cross-cutting that means that they're going to administer it themselves in the lobby if you wanted to administer it you might use oh apparently nothing 
I guess you would use the same form if you were going to administer it to them. Anyway, let's click on it. It will give you a PDF. Page one of the PDF is a disclaimer, use at your own peril. We're not responsible for if you use this in stupid ways. Then page two is um, the only page that you will actually give a client. And that page has 23 questions in 13 categories. And those questions are designed to determine might they potentially have a disorder in this family of disorders. Questions one and two are about depression. If somebody answers zero to both questions one and two and they're being accurate in their self-report, they do not have a depressive disorder. You can automatically rule that out. Um, section three is about mania, section four is anxiety, section five is somatic symptoms, and so on. So um, if you get a positive, which on page three gives you your instructions, for example, if somebody said in that in section one for depression, if they said even mild um, symptoms of either of those two symptoms, then you know you now need to move on to level two. How do you move on to level two? Well, you would go back to that DSM-5 online assessment measure page, go to level two, cross-cutting symptom measures for adults. Here's your depression level two. Click on it. You get that same PDF with that same disclaimer about using this at your own peril. And then page two is the only page you would ever give a client. Or you could administer it, ask these questions yourself in session. I have this stuff on my iPad, which I use as a clipboard during my session, so I can read from it and mark off. And this will tell you what symptoms they experience, and it'll even give you a severity rating. So those are neat, free tools. The next resource that I want to draw your attention to, oh, by the way, that same site has the... Um, cultural formulation interview and the WHODAS that I told you about earlier, the disability assessment scale. That's a new option in place of the GAF score. Also on this page, I show you how you can get to the DSM-5 app. It's expensive. It costs like 65 bucks or something, but there's an app that has your diagnostic criteria. It can go on your phone or your iPad or your tablet. I find it very convenient, very easy to use. I love the keyword search. There's even an ebook version of the DSM-5. There is also on my website a tool that I created that you can have, DSM-5 Substance Use Disorder Assessment Tool. And if you click on that, you will see that I have all 11 symptoms of that new substance use disorder. You can check off which symptoms the client is attesting to, which substances that they experience each symptom with, and when for each substance, because that's the information you need to formulate your diagnosis. After the 11 symptoms, you, it tells you, based on the number of symptoms, which of these disorders may apply. You write in which substances for which disorders. And then your emission status, all your specifiers are on here, too. Even your little disclaimer about the medications. And then I have some presentations that other people gave that are on YouTube that are available as well. Now, the next um, resource that I want to give you before we go into questions and answers is, um, well, first I want to show you um, three things. This is the full DSM-5. What does it have that nothing else has? Well, it has the statistics, how prevalent it is, and those sorts of things, information on the course and length of the illness. But it also gives you differential diagnosis um, tips, which I find very helpful. And you don't see that in many other resources. Or you could get the, the handy-dandy pocket New Testament Bible version of the uh, DSM-5 called the Desk Reference to the Diagnostic Criteria from DSM-5. This has just the diagnostic criteria and nothing else. Very expensive for a small little book. I think it's 65 or 69 bucks. Similarly, this little thin thing is pretty cool. It's called the Pocket Guide to the DSM-5. It gives you wonderful questions that you can ask in plain language of clients to determine if they meet the diagnostic criteria. It too is expensive. And now, ooh, a coupon. Uh, now we'll get to the um, other stuff, some additional training options. Well, you're a FOMCA member, so you get a discount for the FOMCA annual conference, which takes place in February. By my count, there are at least four or five DSM-5 related workshops in that conference. There may be more as things change. 
We've got, um, I'm going to do a piece on just DSM-5 and substance use disorders, two hours on that. And we're going to actually do some interactive exercises to help you actually apply the new diagnostic um, criteria to case scenarios. And then um, Dr. Jim Messina from Troy University, he is awesome, is going to be doing a three-hour overview on DSM-5 and how to use it in clinical settings. And then I'm also going to do a two-hour presentation on DSM-5 insurance, third-party payers, when do I have to do all this stuff and how and how do I document things well enough to get paid for them and all that stuff. And then at the same time, we're going to have a dueling DSM-5 <laughs> conference because there will be a breakout session that Dr. Carlos Zalaket of USF, who is also a wonderful presenter and is the former um, president of, Ofca, of FOMCA, he is doing a piece on DSM-5 in children and adolescents, for those of you that like to work with the kiddos. And then there is a three-hour, um, and I do not know who Diaz is, um, but whoever they are, they are doing a deconstructing the DSM-5 which I am certainly going to attend just because I don't know anything about them. And uh, there, there could be some good information there. So we are now in the place where we can do Q's and A's. Now before um, I get Michael back on here to, to ask me the questions that you guys have been providing, um, if you have questions we don't answer today, there's my email address, me at anorton.com. Send me an email, and I will be glad to answer you your question. So, Michael, you may want to go ahead at this point and unmute yourself and fire away with the first question. Okay, can you hear me, Aaron? I sure can. Okay, just checking. Um, you must have done an absolutely wonderful job. We only have two questions. Oh, well, that's Boy, cool. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. The first one, very simple question, is the DSM-5 being used now for licensing tests for RMHC interns in Florida? Yes, is the answer. They started using it, if I recall correctly, back in April. Um, so the, that is the NCMHCE is the exam that registered mental health counselor interns take in Florida, and they have already moved to DSM-5, so it's a good thing that you attended this webinar. Another question I'm not sure about, uh, just in, in tandem with that, when you take the new test, which is the, C, the C, CCMHCE, right? It's the NCMHCE, which is the same as that credential, though. Right. Yeah, I, I, I took it, too. Um, the, uh, but you can also get the CCMHC credential along with that. Do they give that automatically with your license now? Okay. I no, uh, that I have no they, they don't automatically give you that credential. I think you have to okay. apply... To my knowledge, you have to... To the National Board of Certified Counselors, yeah. Okay, so just yeah. to let folk, folks know, if you take that test, you might might be worth your while to go ahead and apply to NBCC to go ahead and get that credential because it never hurts to have more, more credentials. Yeah. Um, okay, and, and the and other one... Um, go ahead. Yeah, as a side note to that, there is an effort being made to try and convince the VA to um, revise their hiring criteria so that it's not that you have to graduate from a KCREP accredited program, but that either KCREP or you are CCMHC. Um, and that would create a pathway for people who didn't graduate from a KCREP program to work in the VA system as LMHCs. And so we don't know if that will actually happen. That's an effort being made. Um, and the armed forces, the same thing. The U.S. Army, they're trying to get them to do that as well. So there might be a lot of uh, even extra value to getting that credential if you don't come from a KCREP program. We'll see. Which is also another reason to join FOMCA because we're lobbying because, and I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings here, but the social workers have lobbied for years to keep us out of being able to do things, and one of those is participation in TRICARE as well as Medicare, so we're fighting for the life of our profession, so we need to band together. And the other thing that has to do with that CCMHC certification is if you have not graduated from a KCREP school, you have to take that exam. I've been practicing for 25 years. My credentials take up half a page, and I still had to take that exam to be able to um, build through TRICARE. So it's a certification you might want to go for, but you don't have to get the certification. You do have to take that exam. So might as well go for the certification as well, I think. Mm -hmm. There you go. The other question, 
uh, and it and it may be I think you did go over it, but it may, because we've got some time. This is the only other question right now. As I said, you must have done an absolutely wonderful job. Um, oh well, I've got a few more questions here, so I'll ask this one. Um, somebody had asked if we'd gone over substance dependence, which we did. You went over that pretty thoroughly. But personality disorders, you kind of glossed over that. I don't know if you can address that. Did they yes. get melted um, in? The, you know. the reason I didn't cover them is because there essentially are no changes at all. Remember, that's the one where they were going to change it substantially with that new hybrid model, but instead they parked that new model in Section 3 to be considered for future additions and personality disorders remain unchanged from the DSM-4. But look out, um, I would go ahead and start studying what's in Section 3 because it's only a matter of time before we move to a whole new system. That's my opinion. Okay, next question. Diagnosing borderline personality, things to look out for, differential diagnosis. Okay, so this is a question about how do we um, tell borderline personality disorder apart from other diagnoses. Um, so, uh, well, the, the central, this, the defining characteristic for borderline personality disorder, which by the way, and I probably won't spend much time on this if there's another question, because it's the same as it was in DSM-4, no changes there. But basically, um, borderline personality disorder has to do with um, a difficulty sustaining healthy relationships and with emotional dysregulation. So you will see mood swings, just like you'll see in bipolar disorder. The difference is you will not see mania and hypo, hyp, manic and hypomanic episodes if it's just borderline personality disorder. The mood swings will happen in very short time frames. For example, in one 24-hour period, a person with BPD could um, experience significant shifts in mood fluctuation from feeling okay or feeling happy to feeling very angry to feeling very, feeling very sad and so forth. But bipolar disorders, we're talking about for several days or weeks, people will experience depressive symptoms um, or they'll experience manic or hypomanic symptoms enough to be considered a manic or hypomanic episode. Now you also need to rule out substance abuse because of course when people are putting chemicals into their body, they're going to have mood swings and mood fluctuations and have relationship problems and a lot of the things that you see with borderline personality disorder. Um, so there's also, the, there's also the fact that borderline personality disorder, um, there's a lot of co-occurring disorders. A lot of people with BPD will have other disorders. They will sometimes have um, co-occurring anxiety disorders, PTSD, um, they can have a co-occurring bipolar disorder and they can have a co-occurring depressive disorder. Um, you kind of run down the list. There are all kinds of disorders that somebody can have and have BPD. You're going to see um, the dichotomous thinking and the fluctuating between idealizing people and um, you know, you either you can be God or Satan, you can be um, a person's savior. Uh, there you go. So those things you, you might not see as much of in, in the other disorders outside of borderline personality disorder. And then there are the, the frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. They're very concerned about being abandoned or being excluded or being left out. Um, they have a difficult time defining their true sense of self, um, very much focusing on other people to help define who they are. Um, have a very unstable sense of self at their core. And then finally, they can engage in some pretty risky or dangerous behaviors. So this is where you do see overlap and difficulty with differentiating because uh, you might see substance abuse, but you might also see suicidal threats, gestures, or attempts, um, those, and some dangerous behaviors. Not, not, not the other thing with... Somebody can, not, can have BPD, but not have all those things I just talked about, but those are a lot of the distinguishing features. Another subtler thing is the aspect of grandiosity. Borderline personality disorders will tend to be very narcissistic and grandiose at times and then mm -hmm. turn around and hate themselves, which is the splitting you talked about. Mm -hmm. But they also tend to be more grandiose about other people. So, for example, the one that came into my office and said, I've learned more from you in 15 minutes than all my other five therapists combined. That's a bad thing to hear to me. And be careful about <laughs> Yeah, be careful about climbing on that pedestal. It's a long fall when they kick it out from under you. That's right. So. <laughs> You're being set up. Okay, and the last question we have, <laughs> really, 
Um, last question we have for right now is, I would like to know what does the DSM-5 say about the psychotherapy of an individual experiencing homosexual tendencies? Absolutely nothing, because um, homosexuality has not been in the DSM since the 70s. It's not a disorder. It's considered um, a place on a spectrum of human sexuality that is normal and not pathological in and of itself. Now, certainly somebody can have homosexual tendencies and um, have a tremendous amount of distress associated with it. Maybe, for example, they were raised to believe that homosexuality is immoral or evil or a form of demon possession even, something along those lines. And so as they experience homosexual feelings or attractions, they feel incredibly conflicted, they could be depressed, they could be anxious, all, they could be abusing substances to try and self-medicate and so forth. But the sexual orientation itself is not the disorder in those cases. Um, it's more of an adjustment disorder would be a way to think of it in that case. So it says nothing about homosexuality. It's not a disorder. That's all the questions we have, and they're very good questions, and you did a good job, I think. And that's what uh, Connie D'Antonio says. You did an absolutely fantastic job. So that was her question. All right. Well, thank <laughs> Didn't you. Didn't you? <laughs> uh, so that was the question. You. Didn't you? Uh, <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> um, well, it has been an absolute pleasure. If you come up with a question later on, feel free to send me an email. I really hope to see some of you at the annual conference, and I hope to see some of you in future webinars. We're going to soon be announcing our 2015 webinar series. Um, attendance will be free for FOMCA members. The only charges will be if you want CEUs, and then it's going to be $10 if you're a FOMCA member, $30 if you're not a member. And um, this is going to be, um, you've been a part of an his, a historic event today with the very first webinar that we've put on. Love to hear your feedback, and so please make sure you fill out the evaluation form. You will have to do that if you want CEUs. And again, this time only, the CEUs will be free for FOMCA members. And, and just another shameless plug, the, the conference is in February, February 5th, and we have... Um, excellent presenters as we have for the past years. This is really an excellent conference. You cannot go wrong. It's probably the best money you could spend. And the early registration deadline is coming up. I believe it's the 17th. So we have rooms at a very reasonable rate. We have a, a, a discounted uh, price on the, on the uh, conference, assuming you're a FOMCA member. We have an excellent um, comedian who's opening on Thursday night, uh, well worth seeing who's going to basically do, do comedian, a comedy wrapped around our field and being able to laugh at ourselves and, and take a humorous approach. So we would very, very much like to see you there and encourage you to be part of this organization. We are representing you. You've got to help us. That comedian, by the way, is awesome. I've seen him at the annual um, addiction conference here at Clearwater Beach. He does a great act. I'm going to enjoy him. His name is Mark Lundholm. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, thank you very much. We will call this webinar to a close then. I wish you all a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you around.